Papa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome, America, to America's family history show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. It is great to have you along, Genies. We have Jennifer True Love on the show today. You don't know her. You know why? Because she's just an ordinary person doing extraordinary things on behalf of all of us. She is a volunteer for Find a Grave. And she actually helped me out to find a gravestone and get a photo of it, of one of my ancestors in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, so we're going to talk to her about how she got engaged in this work and how long she's been doing it and what she gets out of it because she has a lot of fun and you're going to want to hear everything she has to say. Plus, later in the show, we're going to talk to Nat Taylor. He is the editor of The American Genealogist and there's a big international convention coming to the United States in 2024. You can be a part of it. It covers genealogy and heraldry. If you don't know much about heraldry, Nat will explain that coming up later on in the show. Right now, it's time to check in with Boston. David Allen Lambert is standing by the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. And Dave, I got to throw you a little love here. I'm pretty excited to see here that you have brought about a great thing. And you know, we're always talking about how not everything has been microfilmed and not everything has been digitized yet. And for a long time, There was this 1837 census there in your neck of the woods in Boston in the possession of the Boston City Archives, and you were always bugging them, saying, we got to get this digitized. This has got to be made available, and it has finally happened. It's right online for free. It's a great collection of records, including both immigrants, longtime Bostonians, African-American families. So it's a great way to do your genealogy at a census that's kind of snug right between the 1830 and 1840, those 19th century censuses that don't give us a lot of information. Great to have this new resource available to search. Yes, absolutely. And you pushed for it. And I know a lot of people are going to be appreciative of that. It just goes to show there's still a lot more stuff out there to be found and to be gotten out there. That's not the only place that's put new information out. Fort Ticonderoga out in New York is active for the past month now, starting a project. They're looking between 1755 and 1783, so the French and Indian War right. and the Revolution, and to look into the lives, ready for this, 45,000 soldiers and civilians that had connections from both North America Africa and Europe. Yeah, and they were all gathered there because this was kind of a gateway militarily to Canada and, of course, back to the United States. And both sides typically took control of Fort Ticonderoga. And I I know a lot of people who had ancestors there, including me, and I think you did, too. I surely did. It's a place I'd like to visit. But I'm so glad to see they're doing this work. It will definitely increase tourism if you could find a connection to (laughs) Fort Ticonderoga. There you go. Well, you know, I need that metal detector for Christmas, and I need to go to Wales and hope I can find what somebody found out in a farm field. How about a clay jar with over 2,700 silver and bronze coins? Yes. Dating between 32 BC and 235 AD. Yeah, 2,733 coins were found in this jar. Yeah, and the suspicion is is this was pay for Roman soldiers. You just never know what you're going to find out there. And with genealogy, you just never know what you're going to find, as we both know very well. And in the conversation.com, they put out an article. It says nearly two-thirds of family historians are distressed by what they find should DNA kits come with warnings. Yeah, interesting. And And they go through like five different things that people run into. You know, ancestors behaving badly. Treated cruelly. Sad stories. Family secrets and betrayal. Yeah. And also whether you should reveal those things to people. I mean, a lot of folks wind up getting a lot of counseling as a result of these things. And, you know, there's some legitimate points there, but I think we all have some of those things back there and we know that going in. So we just hope it's not too close to home, if you know what I'm saying. Exactly. DNA has given us such a window into our past that even records can't share with us. Yep. So I think we're very grateful to have it. Uh, Sometimes it can be a bit of a pickle. 
Now, David, I'm seeing that in Massachusetts there, the witch thing has come about, just like we had in Connecticut, the exoneration, and the AP Mm -hmm. put out a story on that, and there you are, smack dab in the middle of this national story. You are a national star because of your witch ancestor. I almost wish that she didn't have any attention and that I didn't have to claim her as an ancestor other than just some sweet lady who lived in 17th century New England. What happened to her? Where was this? Well, she lived in Salisbury, and she was slated to be executed in September of 1692. But either she or her husband bribed the jailer, and she made it off to the northern reaches of New England, and she died in 1700. We're trying to get an apology from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the 211 individuals that were accused, not just those executed. Being a descendant, I think it's a nice gesture. Sure. It goes through, and I'm hoping it will. Absolutely. Hey, we've got to mention here, David, I've made a little discovery this week, and it's kind of put it in my mind that I need to remind everybody about places to find newspaper stories. They're not mm-hmm. always on the big sites. We can't live without the big sites, our sponsors, newspapers.com, right? But mm-hmm. you can go around and find places in cities and states and local historical societies that have things online. And I just found some information in Elizabeth. New Jersey, they have a searchable site for digitized newspapers, and their paper, their main paper in Elizabeth that's been there forever, is not available anywhere else. And I found a story about one of my relatives who was a driver of a cart drawn by a horse. They had a laundry business in 1897, and I guess he got off the cart, and the horse kicked him in the leg, broke his leg, sent him to the hospital, and the doctors were going to amputate his leg. It was going so badly. And then I found another follow-up article later that he was back home and walking around the house with a cane, and then another one a few weeks later where all the neighbors came over and threw a surprise party for him. So wow, (laughs) it was great to see this series of stories that you wouldn't find anywhere else, and it's just a great reminder to me that I can't get stuck in the mindset of, oh, I can only look in a few places, and if it's not there, we just can't get them. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And my own town has done the same thing. All right, David. Thank you very much. Talk to you at the back end of the show with Ask Us Anything. And coming up next, we're going to talk to an amazing volunteer with Find a Grave. Find out what she does. Coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. What have you always hoped your children and grandchildren knew about who they are and where they come from? What traditions and stories do you want them to pass on to their children? How do you find the time to weave together the beautiful history of your family, one ancestor at a time? Or maybe you're ready to find your birth family or a missing branch on your family tree. You don't have to build your family tree and your personal story alone. No matter how much genealogy experience you have, mysterious brick walls happen to all of us. It takes a village to keep your family story alive, and Legacy Tree Genealogist is here to help. Legacy Tree Genealogist provides a team of global professionals with vast experience locating and accurately translating documents, building family trees, and making sense of DNA test results. Contact Legacy Tree Genealogists today. Visit www.legacytree.com to learn more. That's LegacyTree.com. Hi, Genies. Fisher here, major fan of digitized newspapers. And how about a digitized newspaper site that has well over 800 million search pages. There is such a site. It's newspapers.com. They've got newspapers from all across the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. This is where you'll find those remarkable stories, plus birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, ads, and so much more. Newspapers.com is where I found my great aunt's marriage announcement, which was huge since her marriage was not properly recorded. And then there's the story of one relative's 50th anniversary party in 1900 with a list of all the attendees and gifts. Newspapers.com is like that box of chocolates we always hear about. You never know what you're going to get. What will you find? Sign up now at newspapers.com. Use the coupon code EXTREME at checkout to get a special extended 20% discount on a Publisher Extra subscription. Hey, Genies. It's been so fun to watch over the last couple of years as our Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies, has really grown. If you haven't joined yet, thousands of like-minded genealogists are there waiting to help you and to learn from you. 
as all try to make new breakthroughs on difficult lines. Let's face it, there are so many ancestors yet to be found whose names we don't even know yet. All it takes is for one other member to know of a source that can lead you to a breakthrough you've been seeking for years. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies is free. This is where you can brainstorm and celebrate your research victories with others who understand and share your passion for family history research. So sharpen your skills, learn from others, and give back in areas you're already expert in. Join us on Facebook at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. That's Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Hey, welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And, you know, we all are dependent and grateful for all the volunteers who do so much work, say, for family search, indexing records, and also some of the indexing going on right now for the National Archives and doing those pension records of revolutionary soldiers. We also have a passionate group of volunteers with Find a Grave. And these are the people that will go out and wander through a cemetery to take a photo of a grave for you if you request it. And recently, I actually did this for the first time. There are so many grave pictures I've taken myself, but I came across a new story I wanted to investigate, and I put out a request on that. And who should show up but my next guest, Jennifer Trulove. She's in New York City. And Jennifer, how long have you been doing this? I've only actually been doing it about nine months. Really? Photographs. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of just started, but I have a lot of free time. So yeah. <laughs> I've done, I mean, even at this point, it's probably certainly hundreds, if not thousands of photos. Wow. And, and not always requested. So I've, I've sort of done side projects. Sure. Too. Do you have a favorite cemetery that you work? Yeah, I like going to Calvary okay. in Brooklyn. And the reason I like them is available online. It's not just a map of the whole cemetery showing you where the different sections are, but there are section maps. So within a section, you can find out exactly pinpoint where, you know, if you have plot info, you can pinpoint exactly where that will be, which, for instance, at Evergreens, which is another cemetery, it's actually in both Brooklyn and Queens. Yeah. You can stand on the border. The line um, goes right through there. Yes, exactly. I think their mailing address is Brooklyn, but you walk in, depending on which entrance, you might be in Queens, which mm-hmm. is kind of fun. Anyway, at Evergreens, their sections are named instead of numbered, and they don't have section maps available, so you're just wandering around like, oh, you know, so <laughs> I like I like Calvary because it's a little more orderly and that's my preferred place to go and a little sure. closer on the subway too wow I, you know i'm just thinking about traveling around new york city and i've done it many many times i worked in new york city many years ago yeah. and it's not an easy thing to do all the time and for you to actually take requests from people uh, how far across the world have you done photos for some of these folks Oh, you mean the requester? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. You know, I haven't inquired, certainly across the country. And there was a priest in Ireland who was very grateful for my help, which was really fun. And he had a lot of holy priests and nuns and things that were buried in New York that he had asked me to do. He's the only out of country person that I know of. But sometimes I just don't know the person at all. I'll just be, you know, <laughs> they made a request and here's your photo and nice doing business, you know. And sometimes people will say thank you, which is always very nice, which I appreciate. But sometimes they won't. And that's OK, too. Yeah. Request fulfilled. But yeah, definitely someone from Ireland. But I think, you know, probably across the country. And, and that's, I think, the main reason that people aren't in the area. You know, they live in right. California. It's always nice when it's family, you know, something, sure. somebody important to them, because on Find a Grave, you'll find a lot of people that are just uploading thousands of obituaries or thousands of death certificates, and they'll just click request photo, you know, to go along with it. So yeah. it's impersonal to them. Sure. So it's always nice when it's family. Like my favorite response is going to be, oh, my goodness, by seeing this, I now know that my great grandmother is buried here. I never knew that, you know, like that's like yeah. a little happy that you get when you really help out someone on a personal level. But certain so, yeah. number of graves don't have markers on them, right? I mean, oh, so many. probably I too mean, many. Most, yes, I think so. And it's what I've learned as I went along because, oh, they're buried here. Certainly they will have a stone. 
it's more common. It feels more common. I, I haven't done like the data or anything <laughs> right, like that, right. but you know, is it 50% of the time? I feel like it's less that there is a stone. And it's not always because of the fact that a stone wasn't there, but over many, many, many decades, maybe even more than a century, right. the ground just swallows up a lot of those yes. things, don't think you think? You, you had mentioned to me, I think that something had sunk in that you were looking for. There's sunken ones. So at Calvary, the good thing is they're mostly upstanding stones, you know, like yes. taller ones. But you know the cemeteries that are all in ground those are really tough i went to one in jersey one time in newark i was looking for a family member and the literal grass i was like oh is there a stone there i thought that was just a rock you know like Mm -hmm. so those ones that are in ground can really get overtaken but yeah they can disappear i've also seen like just the base is left and for whatever reason whatever was above it either crumbled away or was taken away for repair or whatever reason but you'll see just the base sitting there and then of course there's tons that are just worn down right you know and so like well this this could be it you know it's in the right place (laughs) but i can't be sure i was just talking with david allen lambert from the new england historic genealogical society about this last week about the fact that even when you're dead you have an address isn't that (laughs) weird i mean (laughs) when you think about that you can find me at yeah yeah (laughs) it's the strangest thing so you said you've been doing this now for nine months how often do you go out like every other day really much i mean how it started was so I, I told you i was looking for my family i actually went to evergreens i came home i uploaded to find a grave and i said oh look other people want photos from evergreens i had a nice day i like to do at least seven thousand steps a day sure this is a way instead of like walking to the park and just walking around in circles i'll go to this cemetery and i'll accomplish something and i'll have a lovely day and treat myself to lunch out so that's why i went again it was really just like to get my steps in and help somebody out. So it was nice, you know? So then I would come home, upload the photos that I got. Sometimes I gradually started doing a little genealogical research on the side for the people that I was uploading for, you know, and say, well, they don't have a birth date here. Let me see what I can do about that. So I'm a big fan of the municipal records for New York City. Yes, me too. (laughs) That website is, you know, like literal scans of death certificates, birth certificates, marriage certificates. Fantastic. So I'll just poke around and I'll say, oh, look, they were born in this year. And so I can, you know, suggest an edit add the photo and be like, here you go. Or if there was someone listed on the stone that does not have a memorial, sometimes I'll add a memorial, you know, and add the picture there. So it's not just throwing the photos up there. But once I do that, I'm like, all right, let me go back out and get some more photos, you know? So it kind of ended up being every (laughs) other day. And like I said, I like it better than just going to the park and walking around. So I was going pretty often. I work in the film business and lately people may have heard there's been these strikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have had a lot of free time. Yes, that's affected my own son in that department as well. So let me ask you this. You must run into some interesting people in cemeteries. I don't see that many people, but today I can tell you, and this was the second time I've seen her in a week or two, there's a woman playing an alto saxophone standing in front of a grave. And the first time I saw her, I thought, oh, isn't that nice? Maybe it's her dad or her grandfather and she's serenading. And then I thought, well, she's not very good. She might just be practicing. (laughs) And then today I saw her again in a slightly different area. And I said, oh yeah, she's just here because she doesn't want to like disturb her neighbors. And she's not disturbing anybody where she is. No, that's really true. Practicing the saxophone. So I laughed about that. On occasion, I'll step into the office that they have run there. And let me tell you, the people that work in cemeteries have such nice hearts. You know, like they have that job because they have a way to speaking to people in a hard time. Because that's what I think the Mm -hmm. main part of their job is arranging. Yes. You have a death in the family. How can I help you? What would you need? You know, like you have to have a certain kind of personality. And then, of course, I'm going in there to be like, hey, can you tell me where this person might be buried? And sometimes they have time to do it. Sometimes they don't. But they're nice people. They're really like they care. Yes. So I'd say even 80 or 90 percent of the time if i request information from pretty much any cemetery i will get a kind response in a fairly timely manner some better than others evergreens is fantastic they'll be like same day service you know yeah well i think is that how we met is that you didn't have plot info on your request yeah i just wrote to you and i said hey evergreens is great and you're like they were great here's the plot info that's it 
Yeah, and you got a picture of my great great grandmother's sister's grave, which I had no idea would be there. So happy there was a stone. Yeah, I hate when I come back with bad news. Yeah, well, there were like six requests, and that was the only one that was there, which is not uncommon, you know. No, not at all. I wish more people knew that. Some people have been really brokenhearted and think immediately it's been stolen. I'm like, I mean, (laughs) I don't think anybody really wants to make off with your 200 pound stone, but no, maybe you know, right? You know, make them feel better. And sometimes people will say, "Oh, now that I know there isn't one." I'm going to look into putting one there. I'm like, great. Yeah. Yes. You know? Yes, so I've that's done why that. if there is no stone, I still try and take a photo of their resting place and then copy that photo and do a notated version that says this is exactly where there would be a stone if yeah. there was one. Okay. So that people can look around and I have notated this. This is number seven and this is number six. So therefore, this is number five. You know, right. so your, sure. your guys are grade five. So they can with confidence see that but i notice on find a grave you know i'll go around and i'll look and some people that fill photo requests are just like there wasn't a stone here's a picture of some grass good luck you know like, <laughs> yeah i've gotten that like, actually I, yeah I'd like i'd rather you not do anything well and i should else. brag on you a little bit here jennifer because when you got done on your second trip to evergreens on my behalf you sent me two videos pacing around the area to show me where they are somewhere in here because there's no stone and uh, I I so appreciated that and got such a kick out of it that you enjoy what you do so much so passionately and I know that you're representative of many people who do this for find a grave have you talked to others who do this yeah, I've just kind of messaged back and forth sometimes. And what I did notice, because, you know, I haven't lived in New York for so many years, you got to be careful. Because even yeah. if you're like, hey, do you mind if I, you might get a bad response, you know? So sure. I'm like a little on edge, like, how's this going to go? But I'll say something like, yeah, it looks like the picture attached to this memorial doesn't quite look right. And, you know, you, you might get back someone who goes, mind your own business. That has never happened. In fact, it's much the opposite. I remember one guy said to me, well, that's why they have erasers on pencils. <laughs> it's not the first mistake I made. And it's not going to be the last. And thanks for letting me know. And I'll fix that right away. She is Jennifer True Love. She's a volunteer for Find a Grave. And uh, you can see why I wanted to have Jennifer on the show this week. <laughs> Jennifer, it's been an absolute delight to meet you. And thank you so much for the work you did for me and the work you do for so many other people in a place where a lot of people think they're unfriendly. Oh, <laughs> quite the opposite. It was so nice to get to meet you this way. It's so unique. And thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Great to have you on. Thanks so much for coming on. All right. Take care. And coming up, we're going to talk about genealogy and heraldry. What is that? You'll find out from Nat Taylor, editor of The American Genealogist, coming up next when we return in five minutes. Welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. Big things coming up next year, a biennial conference. It's the International Congress of Genealogical and Heraldic Sciences. And I've got my next guest on the line who's tied to this greatly. It's Nat Taylor. He is the editor of The American Genealogist. And Nat, welcome to the show. This is a, a big thing coming up next year. Absolutely. It's held every two years, and it's been going since the 1950s, mostly in Europe. This is only the third time it's been in North America, and it's the first time in the United States. It's really a conference of a different flavor and different tone. It'll be off the beaten track for people interested in genealogy or heraldry. Right. And this is in September of next year in Boston, which sounds great. Let's talk about heraldry a little bit. I don't know that most amateur genealogists, who I think most of us are, who listen to this show and are learning, heraldry is just not a really commonly understood thing. This goes way back, doesn't it? Yeah. So genealogy and heraldry are really thought of as sister disciplines, and they have evolved together over hundreds of years, really from their roots in Europe in the early modern period. Heraldry is all about coats of arms. It's all about visual symbols of family identity. 
And the people who became experts in this, both as artists and also keeping track of who used what symbols, they were really our first genealogists. And that's just evolved ever since then. It kind of fell off the radar a little bit in more modern times. But with the Internet and with access to visual sources, heraldry is having a real resurgence now. Interesting, because uh, you were telling me off air before that this kind of disappeared in the 70s and now it's making a comeback because we have all this wave of interest in genealogical research, DNA, family history. The old coats of arms, they really kind of only followed one line, right? Yeah. So the idea of heraldry is that they are symbols that were inherited in families and that they were originally symbols used by the upper classes. But one of the things that happened, not just in the United States, but all over the world in areas influenced by Europe where heraldry really originated, is that people realized that heraldry could be for anyone. And certainly in the U.S., where there's no government regulation of heraldry, people have been and still are designing coats of arms for themselves. And it's part of the same process of exploring and then expressing your family identity. It still goes hand in hand with genealogy that way. So this has a great tie-in with our friends over at the New England Historic Genealogy. Society. Tell me about their registries that they have going on there. There are really two types, right? Yeah. So I'm a volunteer there on the Committee on Heraldry, which is actually the oldest group of people studying heraldry that's not connected to a government organization, the oldest group of its kind in the world, older even than any European groups. Since 1864, there's been a group within the New England Society studying coats of arms, preserving information about them, researching them, and then in the last hundred years, recording coats of arms. So we have two registers. One is called a roll of arms, which is historically attested coats of arms brought to America by immigrants from mostly European countries, also from Canada. And this has been published serially for over 100 years. The most recent updates were published in the quarterly journal, The Register, and are coming out as a book in the next few months. But it's also a living thing. People are always designing new coats of arms for themselves. And we register modern coats of arms and we publish their textual descriptions in our annual reports. And that's something we've been doing and publishing and keeping track of for decades as well. Interesting. So people are actually using probably a lot of modern symbols that you never would have seen centuries ago to represent you know, occupations and where they lived and things like that. Yeah, I mean, the symbolic language, the vocabulary is constantly expanding, but we still adhere to some rules that really are all around recognizability that bring forward kind of traditional conventions, but explore them and display them in new ways. So heraldry is very much a living art as well as a science. So help people understand, you know, they may be listening to this and going, well, I can just go down to the shirt store there. There's a, a Johnson family shirt with a coat of arms on that. That isn't really how it works, is it? Yeah, that's the one faux pas. The one thing that you shouldn't do unless you know with your research in your own family that takes you back, usually in the male line, because it's one of these patriarchal things, to an ancestor who you know used that particular coat of arms. The purchase and sale of existing designs, the problem with that is that they go with a family. Every coat of arms that exists in the world goes with a specific family, not a surname. So that's really a faux pas to simply get one at a gift shop and have it on a mug or a t-shirt or a keychain. The way it was originally done always was to design your own if you want right. to use one. It's fascinating to me that it's gone from, you know, the upper class to now pretty much anybody can do that. And it's really the way it should be, especially as we get deeper and deeper into more and more family lines that have been extended through this tidal wave of information, especially the last 20 years. Absolutely. And one of the beneficiaries of the tidal wave of information is that it's not just about the traditional kind of ruling families of the colonies out of which our country grew. Heraldry comes to the United States from over 20 different countries and a lot of different national traditions. You can see them in the design, kind of the design flavor, heraldry, mostly from European countries, but as I said, also from Canada and Mexico into the United States. It's a very multi cultural, varied, and addictive discipline to look into. <laughs> Fascinating. Now, you've got a deadline coming up here, like in just a couple of days. Let's talk about that. 
Absolutely. So the Congress is next September 2024, and the registration for the Congress hasn't opened up yet. It's going to open up pretty quickly. But if you are a genealogist or interested in heraldry who wants to participate as a lecturer, as a speaker, the call for speakers is still open, and it should close right here in the middle of November. So it's open for just a couple more days till the 15th. It may be extended, but if you have a genealogical speaking, because it's genealogy and not just heraldry. You don't have to link them both uh, right. to participate. You should go to the website, AmericanAncestors.org slash ICGHS-2024 or BostonCongress2024.org for the call for speakers. Proposals to present are accepted until the upcoming deadline and possibly afterwards. But then anybody who's going to be in the area or able to travel to it will be welcome to register as an attendee after that. All right. And it's important to understand there's a lot of genealogy at this conference. That's half of it at least, right? Yes. So traditionally, it's half and half. And the idea is you rub elbows with people maybe who come for other reasons, and you're going to get new perspectives. And because it's an international Congress, it's going to be bringing a lot of people over from Europe and down from Canada. It's an opportunity to learn from them and also to show those folks how we do it here. I would imagine then each country has its own little take on how this is done. I suppose, and sometimes there are some arguments or disagreements or at least sort of bewilderment when folks rub shoulders with others. The language is also interesting. You know, heraldry has a language of its own. There may be languages other than English spoken at the Congress. We've been working on different models for whether translated summaries are available, but it adds to the mystique and the fun also of hearing people from other countries for whom English may not even be their second or third language who are really telling us something that we don't know much about. He is Nat Taylor. He is the editor of The American Genealogist, talking about the International Congress of Genealogy and Heraldic Sciences coming up next year in Boston. It sounds like a lot of fun, Nat, and we appreciate your time coming on and telling us about it. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure, and we're all looking forward to it. And coming up next, David Allen Lambert returns for another round of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hi, Genies. Fisher here, major fan of digitized newspapers. And how about a digitized newspaper site that has well over 800 million searchable pages? There is such a site. It's newspapers.com. They've got newspapers from all across the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. This is where you'll find those remarkable stories, plus birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, ads, and so much more. Newspapers.com is where I found my great aunt marriage announcement, which was huge since her marriage was not properly recorded. And then there's the story of one relative's 50th anniversary party in 1900, with a list of all the attendees and gifts. Newspapers.com is like that box of chocolates we always hear about. You never know what you're going to get. What will you find? Sign up now at Newspapers.com. Use the coupon code EXTREME at checkout to get a special extended 20% discount on a Publisher Extra subscription. Hey, Genies. It's been so fun to watch over the last couple of years as our Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies, has really grown. If you haven't joined yet, thousands of like-minded genealogists are there waiting to help you and to learn from you as all try to make new breakthroughs on difficult lines. Let's face it, there are so many ancestors yet to be found whose names we don't even know yet. All it takes is for one other member to know of a source that can lead you to a breakthrough you've been seeking for years. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies is free. This is where you can brainstorm and celebrate your research victories with others who understand and share your passion for family history research. So sharpen your skills, learn from others, and give back in areas you're already expert in. Join us on Facebook at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. 
That's genealogy and family history breakthrough strategies. What have you always hoped your children and grandchildren knew about who they are and where they come from? What traditions and stories do you want them to pass on to their children? How do you find the time to weave together the beautiful history of your family, one ancestor at a time? Or maybe you're ready to find your birth family or a missing branch on your family tree. You don't have to build your family tree and your personal story alone. No matter how much genealogy experience you have, mysterious brick walls happen to all of us. It takes a village to keep your family story alive, and Legacy Tree Genealogist is here to help. Legacy Tree Genealogist provides a team of of global professionals with vast experience locating and accurately translating documents, building family trees, and making sense of DNA test results. Contact Legacy Tree Genealogists today. Visit www.legacytree.com to learn more. That's legacytree.com. All right, we're back for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fish here, and David Allen Lambert is back from NEHGS. David, our first question comes from Washington, Utah. It's Anne Marie, and she says, Fisher and Dave, a while ago, I remember you guys talking about ancestral trading cards. Would this be a good thing for a Christmas gift? Anne Marie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you know, if anybody in my family is listening, please do so. I can send you my GEDCOM file and access to all my <laughs> accounts on Ancestry. Get going. There's only 60 or so days left. Well, right? That's just the um, point right there, David. I don't think it's a good thing for Christmas at this point. No, if you were to no. do this. I did this project uh, a few years ago during the pandemic and mm -hmm. then set a set out to one set of grandkids in Germany and sent a set to some other grandkids right here within my own state. And they all love them, especially my grandkids in Germany. They talk about this all the time to this day, that they still mm -hmm. love going through and learning from the stories on the back. But I will say this. Have you ever done this, by the way, Dave? I have, and I've been really tempted to do so. I think that my kids, maybe when they were small, I don't have grandkids yet, mm -hmm. would probably would have loved it. Now they're probably like, Dad, we know who this person <laughs> is. The picture is in the living room. <laughs> well, it was like $80 a set for what I was mm -hmm. doing. And yep. it took a real long time because if you've ever collected baseball cards, you know what it's like, mm -hmm. what's on the back, all these little oh, detailed sure. statistics. Well, you got to put the date of birth. You got to put the place of birth. You got to do the same for marriage and death, all the spouses, full names, information yep. about them, a write up. What was their occupation for each card? Unless you don't want to have anything to do with Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's I just think true. it's too tight, you know? Well, think about the baseball card. Every year it says the teams they played for. How about every year what address someone was oh. on? You have so many options here. And then you could even do limited edition. Like, oh, remember the ancestral <laughs> coin thing we talked about a couple of years ago? Yep. You could have certain coins, a limited edition has the coin of the year of their birth embedded in the card. Uh, <laughs> Stop signature it. Signature cards. And bubble gum. I know. Stop it. Uh, <laughs> now, here, here's the thing, though. And you're right. I mean, actually, if you want to talk about a good Christmas project, the ancestral coin thing would be a great way to go. Because that is something you could do fairly quickly, and you don't have to complete it by Christmas. You just have to get started and show them how it works, and then add I something it, to it periodically. And I thought of a new one. Yeah. How about ancestral stamps? Cheap, from all the different countries, stamped from the year of birth of your immigrant ancestor from Czechoslovakia. It's possible. Yeah, actually, probably now. could be easier to get those than actually find the records of ancestors from Czechoslovakia, <laughs> right? That's true. So I do love the trading cards, the ancestral cards. If you Google them online, you will see there are all kinds of different types that are available, mm -hmm. some that are already pre-made that talk about different ancient customs and the like. That isn't what we're talking about here. Right. We're talking about a template, basically, by which you make a set of cards, and how many go in it is really up to you. They are quite expensive, as I mentioned, but you know, at the end of the day, if you really want a real meaty project, that is a real good way to go, and eventually maybe have that ready for next year 
and they'll have something maybe they don't appreciate when they're really young, but as they get older, they will. And I can tell you right now, I have one granddaughter in particular who absolutely loves breaking out those cards. We were visiting her this past summer in Germany, and she brought it up. And it's several years old. She still loves looking at them. That's great. That was a win-win. Think of CDVs, card to receipts, those early family yes. photos. When somebody wrote the information on the back, they are the forerunner to baseball <laughs> cards just in general. That's what they use, that real photo on the front, and the cardboard stock on the back. All right. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie, for the question. Hopefully that helps you out, and good luck. Got another one coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. We're going to wrap it up with our final question here on Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. This is from Jackson in Honolulu. And he says, guys, I'm still scratching my head about artificial intelligence and family history. How do you guys use AI or do you? Oh, there's a loaded question, Dave. Do you? You know, I do, but I'm using it to scour the information instead of just playing Google searches to find something. Like if I want to find out, tell me about Boston in 1750, it's going to give me Hmm. breakdowns of information that it has found across the Internet. Now, taking that and then maybe rewriting it a little bit so you're not using completely AI, which, which is one of the problems they're facing in college this these days. Yeah. My daughter goes plagiarism. to college. And the plagiarism of AI, even though AI is really not a person, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's a different type of plagiarism, I suppose. The big difference is if you Google, you get this whole list of websites that might have an answer to your question. If AI does the question, then they combine all the materials they find. I have found things like you talked about where I said, okay, Mm -hmm. what happened in New York City in 1862? I was working Mm -hmm. on my novel back in the summer or the late spring somewhere in there, and it would give me a breakout of what was happening in the city at that time. Then I could go back, though, and double check it and make sure it's accurate because Mm -hmm. AI may be smart at gathering all the stuff, but it may not be smart at knowing which information is true and which information is incorrect. And as we know, especially when it comes to history, there's a lot of bad info out there. Oh, true, because it could be scouring from a book that was written in 1863 that maybe isn't as good as one that was done in 1913. Right. And the other thing is the facts. AI doesn't have the technology yet, I believe, to say, give me this, but I want you to give me a footnote and citation and a bibliography at the end of all the resources you use. Now, eventually, I would imagine it's possible. I'd like to think AI has really gone far with photography and being able to create an image, if oh, yeah. you will. Yes. Yeah, I think that's amazing. If you want to know how I use AI, when we post the podcast for Extreme Genes, there's typically a photograph there that kind of illustrates what the topic is. I can actually go to DALI, which is connected with chat. It's an art site, and I can say, give me a photograph. Like last week, I said... Show me a photograph of a teenage boy going up into an old farmhouse and finding a sea chest. Dally gave me four of them to choose from, and one of them was fantastic. It was perfect to illustrate the story that our guest told us last week. So that was very helpful there. I don't know that the individual genealogist is using AI nearly as much as we are benefiting from the use of AI by all the major companies. David, you talked about photography. Obviously, my Mm -hmm. heritage really took the lead with that with their Absolutely. focusing, with their colorization. Now we've seen Ancestry has done some of those same things. And then we also have AI translating handwriting, which was mm-hmm. long ago, the Holy Grail. So it's a huge thing that's happening there. In fact, we've had a couple of episodes in recent weeks talking about AI, where it's going, where it's been, what's happening right now that you might want to go back and catch up on at ExtremeGenes.com under our podcast archives. And coming in 2024, I am sure that at Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, Utah, there will be plenty of AI-related lectures and vendors. So stay tuned. We're at the tip of the AI iceberg. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. David, thank you so much. Talk to you next week. 
All right, my friend. All right, and that's our show for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks also to Jennifer True Love, the volunteer for Find a Grave, talking about her experience with that, and Nat Taylor, the editor of the American Genealogist, for coming on and talking about heraldry and the international conference that's coming to the U.S. in 2024 and how you can be a part of it if you act fast. If you missed any of the show or want to catch it again, of course, listen to the podcast on Apple Media, iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, Spotify. We're all over the place. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 